Hello once again. We are back to an introduction to Islam. In this case, we are doing session number 11. We're getting very close to the end of this, and I hope you feel good about that and feel that it's been productive up to this point. And I trust that this session and the last one will also be informative. This session focuses on the idea of profiling your Muslim friend. Now, that may sound somehow a little bit mechanical, but in fact what we're suggesting is that as you meet and know Muslims, you really want to get to know them as individuals. We've noted before that there are more than a billion Muslims on the face of God's earth and that they fall into some 930 different people groups. We've alluded to the fact that 42 different nations claim to be Islamic nations. In addition to that, there are Muslims found in dozens and dozens of other countries where they are a minority, and hence that particular nation in which they live does not see it as in any way being officially a Muslim country. People are people, ultimately individuals. And our task, even though Muslims are caught up in a group-oriented culture, our task ultimately is to see them as individuals and try to appreciate them in that particular uh, dimension of their existence. One of the things that we have to wrestle with in terms of seeing Muslims as people is the stereotypes that so often uh, are fostered and foisted upon us through movies, magazines, television, news reporting, and other avenues that bring impressions, often sound bites, as it were, that create images that stick in our minds. Stereotypes seem to be a part of life. In one sense, they serve a good purpose, in another sense, from a Christian perspective, they're a problem. The good side is that stereotypes tend to save us from information overload. That is, they allow us to deal with masses of material by reducing things to the lowest common denominator, to the point of generalizing, and yet that generalization often has a huge degree of inaccuracy in it. Thus you may come to know an African American. You simply conclude, well, I know about African Americans. He or she is an African American, and thus I know about them. The stereotypes that we see of Hispanics, particularly of people from Mexico, images that turn up in coffee advertisements, advertisements for Mexican restaurants and products and different kinds, usually somewhere along the line will involve the picture of a cactus, a burrow, someone with a shawl thrown over his shoulder, and a huge hat, often sitting with head bowed asleep. Mexicans? Well, no, not really. It's a stereotype. And yet, if we are told that someone is a Mexican, these stereotypes subtly come into our minds and we are able to say, oh, I know something about Mexicans, thus I know a bit about this individual who has just been mentioned. And probably the truth is we know nothing at all about them. The bad side of stereotypes is that they dehumanize. They turn people into objects rather than allowing them to stand on their own two feet as unique individuals with their own name, their own family, their own history, their own preferences and thoughts. As the people of God, we ought to look at others as we would like God to look at us. We want God to recognize each one of us as an individual. I want him to know my name the color of my skin, the color of my eyes. Jesus talks about knowing the numbers of the hairs of our head. 
I want God to be just that personally and intimately acquainted with me. That's important. And of course God is. But that's a pattern or a model for us. It says then that as we come to know other people, and particularly as we come into a relationship designed to bring them to faith in Jesus Christ, we need to be as personal and as personable in our interaction and acquaintance with that person as we possibly can. We need to try to take steps in the direction of knowing the very number of the hairs on their head, so to speak. Stereotypes, if we allow them to control us, turn us away from that very worthy and very biblical end. Now when it comes to Muslims, we are confronted with incredible stereotypes. Let me suggest a couple to you. One stereotype is that all Muslims are Arabs. Now you realize that that's not the case. If you go back and remember the things that we said in the introductory session when we began this introduction to Islam, we noted for you that of the top ten countries, Muslim countries in the world, that is the countries with the largest numbers of Muslims living within their citizenry, we noted that only two of them are Arabic speaking, Egypt and Algeria. And in the list of the top ten, Egypt is number eight and Algeria is number ten. And you put the population of those two together and they don't even begin to equal the Muslim population of the country of Bangladesh. You will remember that we indicated that Arabic speakers are only 20%, if that much, of all the Muslims in the world. In other words, 80% or even more of the Muslims in the world are non-Arabs. How then can we allow ourselves to be influenced by a stereotype that says Muslim equals Arab, and often we reverse it, and Arab equals Muslim. Neither part of that statement is true. All Arabs are not Muslims. There are at least 10 million Arabic speakers who are Christians in the country of Egypt, and smaller numbers found in other Arab countries. So the equation is not true on either side. Muslim equals Arab, Arab equals Muslim. But then what's the stereotype that comes with this idea of Muslim and Arab? Well, I would suggest to you it's, it's things like camels and sand dunes and tents and people who wear long flowing robes and who cover their heads with some sort of a particular kind of long flowing cloth. That's the stereotype. Now it's true. There are Muslims and there are Arab Muslims who dress somewhat like that. There are Muslims whose life revolves around a camel culture, who live in tents, who are Bedouins on the edge of the desert. But the vast majority of Muslims in the world simply do not match that stereotype at all. In fact, the vast number of Arabs who are Muslims do not in any way resemble that stereotype. It is false. Another stereotype we have carries this equation out a step farther. It says Muslim equals Arab, which in turn equals terrorist. The media has been very good at this. It always focuses in on those tragic occasions when a plane is hijacked or a building is bombed. And almost instinctively in our society when something of this kind happens, we think Arab Muslim terrorists. And yet in fact, the vast majority of Muslims and in fact the vast majority of Arabs 
have nothing to do with terrorism. In fact, they are appalled by it. They would tell you this is not Islamic. They would insist that the way of Islam is the way of peace. Now that may be very hard for some of us to process. And yet part of the reason for the difficulty in processing it, processing it is the degree to which we have been brainwashed by a media that likes to portray Muslims and Arabs in a certain light. Thus we come away feeling, oh, these people are dangerous. Everyone is packing a pistol, or at least had a wicked-looking dagger stuck in their belt. If they're driving a car, possibly it's filled with plastic explosives, and they're simply looking for some foreigner or some foreign institution to run it into, to blow it up. Nothing could be a greater lie. You and I cannot allow these sorts of stereotypes to control us. Another stereotype with regard to Muslims that often comes to the fore is the idea that all Muslims, and often again the idea of Arab enters into the equation, all Muslims are rich. Part of this goes back to the oil producing countries, most of which are in the Middle East, where indeed in some cases there is fabulous wealth. But the majority of Muslims in the world have no access to that kind of wealth. It is true that in some ways some Muslim countries and individuals are among the richest in the world. The Sultan of Brunei. Brunei is a small country in Southeast Asia on one of the islands that otherwise is divided between Malaysia and Indonesia. The Sultan of Brunei, who is a Muslim, is the richest man in the world. On the other hand, some of the poorest people in the world are found in Muslim countries. In fact, the majority of people in most Muslim countries live very meager lives. So this idea that a Muslim is somehow fat and sleek and rich, having oil money at his disposal at a moment's notice, driving big cars, living in fancy homes, again, is a stereotype. And sometimes the media has fostered this idea. We have to recognize that within the Muslim world, there are huge cities. In fact, if you took the top 25 cities in the world in sheer population, at least seven of them would be Muslim. Cairo, the biggest city in Africa. Baghdad, the capital of Iraq. Tehran, the capital of Iran. Karachi, the major seaport for Pakistan. Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh. And Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. Oh, and by the way, I forgot Istanbul, a major, major city in Turkey. Each of these cities has a population of 10 million people or more. Each of these cities has places of intense poverty. Each of these cities has sections that would rival anything in the United States or Europe in terms of wealth and sophistication. Each of these cities has universities of world renown where students, not unlike the students in this country, attend school. You see, these sorts of things usually are simply off our mental maps because we have somehow been taken captive by the stereotypes. So we need to try to set those aside. Muslims are people, and we need to see them as people. And in seeing them as people, this means that we come to recognize that they face the same kinds of life issues and life challenges that you and I do. We need to understand this. Muslims are concerned about jobs. 
They're concerned about job security. They're concerned about earning enough money so that at the end of the month, the money and the bills at least come out more or less even. They are concerned about education. Young Muslim men and women desire to get ahead, and they're seeking the best ways to do that. They would like to find their ways into good universities to prepare themselves. Muslims are concerned about what they will do when the age of retirement comes. Muslims are concerned with the same sorts of events that are wrapped up with emotional baggage that confront you and me. They, they have fears. Fear that their children will be run over. Fear that somehow they will fail in their business. Fear that they will be struck by a disease like cancer. They have joy. Joy associated with parties and marriages and the celebrations of birthdays. They experience a sense of emptiness and loss when families break up, when children disappoint, when death strikes a loved one. The point in all of this is simply to say that Muslims are people like us. And it's only as we really begin to grasp that, not only with our heads, but at a deep emotional level, that we will be in a position to relate to Muslims in a constructive way. Part of profiling your Muslim friend begins with this very simple, basic act seeing this person as a human being like yourself. Now I have an assignment for you. And I want you to post this back to me. I want you to think about the stereotypes regarding Muslims that spring to your mind when someone says Muslim, Arab, Islam, Middle East, or something of that kind. I want you to simply try to enumerate some of those. And then I want you to ask yourself, where has this come from? Has it come from associates? Has it arisen from within your family? Often members of our families betray a great deal of bias or prejudice that we pick up almost incidentally. Where has it come from? Think about that and try to reflect on that as you post that impression back to me as well. As we press ahead in this matter of profiling our Muslim friend, there are at least three other things that we need to look at. We need to consider who this Muslim is culturally. We need to consider who this Muslim is socially or in terms of sociological categories. And we need to determine who this Muslim is in terms of theological preferences, experiences, and orientation. First, the culture. Who is this Muslim man or woman that I am in touch with in terms of culture? Why is this important? Well, it's important because culture is one of the primary shapers of the personality and the actions and the preferences of the individual. Culture determines such things as preferences in dress and the kind of statement one is attempting to make through dressing in a particular way. Culture determines the foods that an individual eats and those things that that individual refuses to eat because somehow they are not perceived as being food. For example, the French love escogar, which from my perspective is sort of a fancy name for snails. I don't eat snails. I have a son and a daughter. My son's wife is from the Philippines. She grew up on the island of Luzon in a small village out from Manila. In her home community, people eat dog. I have a dog. 
a wonderful pet. I would never think of eating my dog. And yet, certain people in the Philippines view dog as food. In the United States, dog is not food. This is a cultural determination. Culture, in effect, defines what is food and what is not food. Now, why is this important? Well, if you're going to seek to be hospitable to the Muslim, then you're going to have to try along the way not only to introduce her to American foods, but at the same time in doing that, you're going to have to try to avoid those food taboos, those foods that are, that are simply forbidden from their perspective. You're going to have to try to understand what they like to eat and maybe on occasion serve that or be willing to participate with them in that kind of a meal which they have prepared for you. These are cultural issues. Language and culture interact like the fingers of your two hands come together. Language plays some interesting roles in our lives. It helps give shape to life. It, in fact, defines how things come together in the mind and the worldview of a person. So, what language does this person speak? Not that you necessarily are going to have to learn that language, particularly if you're meeting that individual in this country. But to learn a few words of their language might indeed be a gesture of accommodation and uh, a demonstration of real interest in them. But as you know something of their language, you begin to see a bit about how they put life together. And thus, an Arabic speaker and an Indonesian speaker, speaking different languages, have different categories for the organization of life. Culture and values go together. This we have already talked about at some length. Culture says something about the limitations that are imposed upon an individual. Culture says what variations in terms of behavior and dress are acceptable, where the limits are. In our society, sometimes it seems as if there are almost no limits in terms of how people may behave, how they may dress or not dress, how, what they may do with their hair, or in terms of ornamentation, even the piercing of the body. Now, whatever you think about that, Muslims from different cultures have different attitudes toward those things. In some Islamic society, beauty marks are very acceptable. In some Islamic societies, body tattoos, often done on the hands and the forearms in terms of very elaborate designs. Now, admittedly, they're temporary. They'll last about 60 days. But nonetheless, those are acceptable and appreciated. Again, this is not to say that you have to do this. But it's to say that you can begin to have some sense of the variations and the limits on variations that function in the life of this Muslim friend of yours as you come to know their culture. Culture often determines certain aspects of the Muslims' attitude toward Christianity. Muslims from Afghanistan have really never had any meaningful experience of Christians. They've never seen churches in this modern age. On the other hand, Muslims from the Middle East have always known of churches. In fact, there were long-established churches in countries like Iraq and Syria and Egypt long before Islam ever came. And those churches are still there. So the, the culture of Egypt, the culture of Syria, the culture of Iraq, in terms of shaping experience and attitude toward Christians and toward churches, is very different from 
the cultural shaping that has gone on in terms of one who is from Afghanistan. It is important for us to come to know who these Muslims are culturally. We need also to know who they are sociologically. Now a simple way of talking about this is in terms of these kinds of categories. We're basically asking where does someone stand when they look at something? You are looking from where? You can imagine what I'm talking about. If you are up close to a mountain, you cannot see the top of it. Far away, you can see the entire mountain and maybe another mountain behind it. The closer you come to the front mountain, the sooner the mountain behind it vanishes from your sight. Where you look from makes a great deal of difference. All of us look from some point sociologically. And that, in turn, has to do with our ethnicity or our race. And the perspective that people have often is very different because of where they look from. Another issue is who you look with. Put very simply, who are your immediate companions, your reference group, your peers? Do you come from a, a setting where there is considerable need economically, where there has been little education? Or do you come from a place where people are middle class? Everyone owns a car. Who are your peers? Who do you look with? Again, this involves a sociological dimension and simply suggests that the peers that we have influence the perspective that we take. People who are well-to-do looking at poor people often are inclined to judge them as being lazy. After all, if they worked, they would have any and everything they need. Well, maybe so, but also probably not so, depending on the social setting in which they find themselves. So who is this Muslim? Who is this Muslim in terms of ethnicity and race? Who is this Muslim in terms of the peers that they have always associated with who have helped shape how they look at life? And then there is the question of what you look through. This basically has to do with your life experience. As you can see from these videos, I wear glasses. I look through a certain prescription. In the same way, every one of us looks at life, as it were, through a set of glasses. A set of glasses that consist of our experience in life. How do you look at the word father? What do you think about that? That will depend to a large degree on your experience. If you've had a good father, then the word father is probably a very good word for you. And to say that God is our father in heaven probably elicits very positive feelings. On the other hand, if you never knew your father, or even worse, if you wish you could have never known him, because whenever he was around, he was intoxicated, he was violent, and he was abusive of you, of your brothers or sisters, of your mother or father, as the case may be. If that's been your experience, then the word father is a very negative word to you. And to say that God is our father in heaven may not in any way create warm, fuzzy feelings in the center of your being. You see, the issue is what you are looking through. So what is this Muslim friend of ours looking through? What has her experience been with Americans, with Christians, with family, with any sort of organized religion, with holy books, 
with people who claim to be able to explain religious things. What are they looking through? And finally, the question or the issue comes up, what do you look at? This simply means, as you look at things, do you look very narrowly or do you look broadly? In one sense, it's sort of like asking, is the lighting a floodlight? You've been to plays, you've seen the stage, you've seen the wings and the most of the stage primarily darkened. You've seen a central character in the middle of the stage and a floodlight on that character. When that happens, your attention is concentrated very narrowly. And what's going on in the background and the wings is simply not drawn to your eye and to your mind, in part because it's not lighted, but more than that because it's not central to the action of the moment. On the other hand, to floodlight a stage suddenly makes everything visible, and you can scan very broadly and see what's going on. All of us, as we encounter life in different circumstances and different times, either floodlight or spotlight, one or the other. We either look narrowly and miss a lot of other things, or we look broadly and take in the whole scene and background. What is this Muslim friend of yours like in this regard? Because this, again, is often shaped by sociological factors. Do they tend to look at things very, very narrowly as if they are disconnected from everything else in life? Or do they tend to look broadly? Now, typically, we don't do just one or the other. We move back and forth between the two depending, the time, depending on the time and the issue at hand. But you need to try to get a feeling sociologically for this Muslim friend of yours by asking yourself, where is this person looking from? Who are they looking with? What are they looking through? And what are they looking at? The other dimension that I mentioned earlier is theological. We've already enumerated the various kinds of diversities that are within Islam. Denominational diversity, the main denominations, the Sunni and the Shia, and the sub-denominations under those. We've enumerated for you the different tendencies within those denominations. That is, theological orientation. Some people being conservative, fundamentalist, as it were. Some people being progressive. Some being very secular. Some being very mystical and experiential in their focus. And others being caught up in folk Islam with its concern for power and self-preservation. Where is this Muslim friend of yours in this regard? You might remember that in terms of the fundamentalist, there is a kind of a continuum in which an individual feels a great deal of intensity of involvement. Some, in terms of the intensity level, or at a 9 or a 10. Others are very intense, but probably a 2 or a 3. Some of this will be determined by the part of the world they come from. Afghans would tend more to this intense continuum and fall out at different points along it. On the other hand, the moderate might be an individual for whom intensity in terms of allegiance to Islam and following the details of Islam is sort of along the middle somewhere. I mean, they're not even over on the intense continuum with the fundamentalists. They have a continuum of their own. And some of them are at an 8 or 9, and some of them are at a 2 or a 3. But this goes with the fact that they're conservative and not fundamentalist. The progressive would have another kind of continuum. And here in terms 
of involvement. There would be a very limited involvement. Now in terms of the limitation of involvement, some would be at an eight or a nine, and some would be at a two or a three. Where is your Muslim friend to be profiled in terms of who they are theologically and whether they fit into the fundamentalist continuum, the conservative continuum, or the progressive continuum? And then where on that continuum are they? More to the right or more to the left? These are the sorts of things that we really need to know if we're going to understand as best we can this Muslim that we want to interact with. The other item in terms of profiling the Muslim has to do with attempting to identify and determine the felt needs of the individual who is here before us. What are they struggling with? This can vary widely. It may be that they're struggling with paying the bills, or they're struggling with how to keep from failing a class, or they're struggling with knowing how to get a social security card, or they're struggling to find an affordable apartment to rent. It may be that they're simply struggling with figuring out those strange coins in their hands at a store when the cashier has told them the bill is $5.36 and they're trying to figure out which of these things do I give this person. And you may say, well, that's a rather simple kind of undertaking. Well, not if you've been in another country and suddenly have been confronted with coins that you don't understand, the value of which you simply don't comprehend. You feel completely lost and a bit foolish and in danger of being exploited because after all the cashier might reach over and simply grab some of the money in exasperation and tell you to go on and take far more than is really what the bill says. So felt needs. To know people's felt needs may take some time. We have to be careful observers. We need to work at building that relationship. We need to understand with a Muslim that honor, again, that old subject has come up once more, that honor is the overriding value. And consequently, because honor controls the Muslim, the Muslim may be reluctant to tell you of the kinds of problems that he or she is having lest they feel shamed. It may take some time to be able to discover those areas of struggle and hurt, but it's well worth our doing. I have an assignment for you. You're going to need in a moment to touch the pause button, and then you're going to go to a link that is labeled Muslims. I want you to read the material that is there. This is material that is produced by Muslims to help other Muslims understand the techniques and the strategies for converting foreigners to Islam. In other words, we're looking in on their evangelistic strategies. I want you to read those. I want you to reflect upon them and then post your insights to me concerning the similarities and the differences between Islamic outreach and Christian outreach. Press the pause button. As we go on now, in this process of profiling our Muslim friend, I want to point you to a totally different area of thought, and yet it is an important area. This is the area that has to do with Muslim women, a very controversial kind of area, one where 
there is great diversity of opinion within Islam and great diversity of opinion coming from outside Islam. How are women viewed in Islam? We need to understand that and then we need to be able to somehow profile something of who this Muslim woman is who is in front of us and some of the kinds of struggles and difficulties that she may be confronted with. The place to begin is in fact by looking at materials from the Quran and the Hadith. So I have another assignment for you and in a moment I want you to hit the pause button. You're going to go to a link that is labeled M U L U S A. This will take you to Quranic and Hadith material with regard to women. I want you to read what's there and then at first glance without spending a great deal of time on it I want you to summarize your sense of the Islamic view of women and post that back to me. So if you'll hit the pause button. Within the realm of Islam today there is considerable difference of opinion with regard to women. The old traditional perspectives basically argue in the direction of the inferiority of women. Many a Muslim will say standing before God a man and a woman are equal in the eyes of God. But in terms of male-female relationships in society this is not the case. Women are seen as inferior. They often are referred to in the traditions as being inferior mentally. And in many instances, they are described as being inferior morally. In fact, there is a hadith that says that Muhammad was given the opportunity of getting a glimpse of hell. And what he saw was that almost all the inhabitants of hell were women. In a court of law, the testimony of a woman is worth only half the testimony of a man. And so you basically have to have two women testifying to the same thing, the same story, in the same way to counteract the testimony of one man. Traditionalists say this is simply the way God has made the world. There are many Muslims today who are within that progressive group that uh, we earlier alluded to. Many women writing in a way that sounds almost like feminist thought. They are arguing that these old views of women are not legitimate. That the hadith has no authority and no place in defining Islamic relationships. They also argue in many cases that the interpretation that has been given to certain Quranic verses is illegitimate. Or, if not illegitimate, then it was uh, an interpretation or a statement made by Muhammad in view of a given situation in the seventh century that has no application or no relevance in today's world. Within the Muslim world, when we think of women and talk about women, we have to understand that once again, women fall out across a wide continuum. There are Islamic countries that have had women presidents. That's never been the case here in the United States. There are women who are lecturers in universities, who own their own businesses, and who operate those businesses on an international kind of plain. There are women who work outside of the home. There are women who choose their own mates. There also are multitudes of women locked into the more traditional kind of life where they almost are property, where marriages are arranged for them, where they have little say in anything except in terms of some of the things 
that go on in the home in what you might think of as the female realm. That is, what's for supper? And how are the clothes going to be washed? And items of that particular kind. Again, I have an assignment for you. In a moment, you need to hit the pause button. And you're going to go to two separate links. The first one is simply called Debate. It is a Christian website. The second one is a Muslim link, and it is entitled UNN.AC. I want you to read the materials that are to be found through these two links, and then post back to me your response. How do you respond to what is being said in each of these two arenas? Why do you suppose there are these two very different points of view coming to the fore in the middle of this discussion? Press the pause button. When we think of the role of women in the Muslim world, we have to realize that, again, the overriding value and concern is honor. Back to that concept once more. The honor of women is fragile as Muslims view society. Thus, society is structured to somehow preserve the honor of women, for if women somehow are shamed, then that brings even greater shame on the wider family. So much of what goes on in an Islamic society is arranged as it is so that the men will not lose honor through the women losing honor. And remember, in many cases, Muslims view the women as somehow coming into life with a degree of inferiority. In fact, when it comes to sexuality in an Islamic setting, in a conservative realm, the assumption is that you leave a man and a woman alone together, unchaperoned, and something sexually happens, and the woman starts it. This somehow is completely the reverse of traditional Western perspectives on the relationship of men and women. So the separation of men and women in Islamic societies is often not so much to protect the women from the men, but rather to, uh, to protect the men from the women who are apt somehow to break loose and behave in inappropriate ways. You need to understand these dimensions that are there in the culture and cultural and social realm as you think about your Muslim friend. You need to understand that these spill over as issues in terms of ministry to Muslim women, which can only be done by women, which must be done with great modesty and with great sensitivity to the culture that one is dealing with. Hopefully these ideas will challenge you to search even further to understand the place, the opportunity, the challenge of women in Islam.